Hello everyone, um, and thank you firstly to the session organisers for allowing me to come and contribute to the session. Um, what I'm going to discuss in the next 15 minutes is related to my PhD when I'm concerned with um, ideas about lithics and the mesonea transition. However, when concerned with uh, books or archaeological theory, I'm no expert, and I merely have a passion for collecting older archaeological books as well as an interest in how the discipline is shaped by theory. So having any relation to an object, in my opinion, uh, whether or not you own it, um, can shape, ignite, or even strengthen the biographies we recite. In this discussion, I will be recovering how generally the context of objects uh, their bio and their biographies affects... Sorry, hang on. <laughs> in this discussion, I will be co um, covering how generally the context of objects affects their biographies. How this is evident in the study of lithics, and books respectively. Then I felt it was important to understand how these two potentially interrelate when we look at um, the physical embodiment of the narratives we create with direct reference to the Mesoneo transition. So from a personal perspective, over the last two years, um, it has become evident to me as I've started to explore my surroundings through photography as an outlet from the mad dashings of a PhD, um, the context of things, objects, animals, and people is always in flux. This is not to say that a particular uh, context is forgotten. It is simply added to humanly or naturally. This enriches the experience of an object's biography. This understanding of where I get object biographies from uh, comes from uh, Humphreys and Smith, 2014. Um, it discusses object uh, narratives having three areas, um, object materiality, object practice, and object biographies. I would ma uh, mainly draw on the object biographies, uh, but do cross over into other areas during this presentation. As most of you will be familiar with, in archaeology, we are left with a partial record of these different contexts, um, the materials we dig up and also the materials we create in terms of narratives. In turn, these objects and um, their contexts are used um, and they're almost weaved into the narratives we create. Um, so in essence, sometimes the, the uh, objects themselves are, um, are shaped more so than in anything else in time and space. This is just the perspective that I've kind of picked up. Um, so in addition, um, it, it, it's, it, it's evident that a single biography never stands out um, and is never alone and is constantly compared to or aligned to other biographies in the narrative making process. Generally, um, when you look at lithics, um, we have some general trends that we can identify for, um, through looking at multiple um, entities and data sets. Um, so occurring between the late Mesolithic and early Neolithic in Britain, primarily a replacement of microlithic technology with leaf-shaped arrowheads and changes from a tranche adds to a polished stone or flaked um, axes, as well as the incorporation of new tools. Since the development of archaeology, these overall contexts have um, always remained present in some way, as I said, the trends, um, but they have always been altered in terms of how the specifics of those um, are put into place in terms of the narratives. Studying lithics, it becomes clear that the context of understanding both individual and multiple biographies, the frame of reference continually shifts in Ephesus from a hunter-gatherer perspective to a migrant farmer to an economic to a climatic. And these have all been used to frame these biograph uh, biographies of objects caught up in the end of a Mesolithic life and the beginning of a Neolithic one. Specific biographies are always uh, subsumed by the greater concern for the overall picture. In short, um, individual biographies are rarely discussed. It is uh, only the sensational, crucial strands of um, the evidence that are related to the transition itself uh, that become the context of reference for biographies of the objects we create. More recently, lithics analysis has sort of tried to overcome uh, the, these types of oversights in terms of the methodological process with obviously social archaeology in the 90s and sort of into the 2000s. Um, considering individual elements of lithics analysis. Um, so core biographies is taken from more than 2000 um, and this creates um, it considers the individual elements and the complex stories that um, cores can tell in terms of um, the artifact biography. For instance, um, it can provide an inference-based approach on how um, 
the, the, the story of how it, the specific rock was worked and reduced. So this has um, a pla this is called platform at right angle. So it has three platforms or three stages of working, um, and it's a two centimeter pebble that's about that long. Um, and trying to visualize this and piece that together is a very challenging and um, complex story. While this approach is really useful for objects with a multi-layered history like the ones above, um, for artifacts that are more simple. Um, the biographies and trying to understand these individual on an individual basis can be restricted in terms of benef the benefit it possesses in creating a narrative. Um, that is if it's used on its own. So in comparison to a more complex objects like cores, um, when you um, look at simple um, biographies of objects like debitage, um, where you have a series of events, one cannot simply observe how prehistoric peoples detached every single blade or flake from a work piece of stone, the action has already happened. Uh, we have to start from the end of the biography and work backwards. This is where a single biographies um, need to be subsumed into the understanding the wider picture of object practice. The graphs above um, exemplify where individual ob attributes of objects have been collated and analyzed to gain a sense of the variation within lithic types. This is um, the object materiality when it's used in conjunction with many other objects to analyze and ascertain the potential inferences regarding lithic technology. In other words, a work object practice. Fumbled with my words a bit there, sorry. Um, both these individual um, and broader approaches to object biographies in lithics ultimately inform the object narratives created. It is clear that these different um, relationships cannot simply be inferred by looking at an um, object alone. Um, this is something to bear in mind when turning our attention to archaeological books. When I started my PhD, I felt it was important to always refer to an original source as possible. Um, so I purchased Child's 1940s uh, Prehistoric Communities of the British Isles. This is a second edition, 1947. I was very surprised to discover upon receiving it that it was more original than I'd anticipated. In the mindset of an artifact specialist, specialist after purchasing the text, I discovered the, the signature and immediately forged a connection with the book. My initial thoughts were to confirm whether it was genuine. Luckily, through social media, um, it was confirmed that it potentially was genuine by uh, many different parties. Archaeologists rarely experience a literature review in the physical form. Um, this is why I felt it was an important avenue to sort of raise um, and explore this aspect in our discipline. Even if others have similar thought processes, I don't feel that these have been vocalized enough, or at least in the public sphere. I moved to trying to characterize the physical condition. Um, so clearly the object has been well used within its lifetime, and the signs of wear on the spine and minor defects on the inside binding show that this has been well used. However, it remains in good physical condition despite these features, um, suggesting the book was well used but cared for. So with regards to the provenance for the what's, when, where and cl uh, are clearly recorded. However, um, while this provides us with a lot of information, like the, the types of um, printing, so obviously just after the war, it potentially was still within the rationing period, so there was a lot of um, restrictions and how much printing could and how it was done, the process. Those types of things are clearly represented in terms of the record, um, but the actual representation of the relationships that connect the book with the people involved and the subject, um, particularly in this context of the Mesonia transition, it's not really well recorded or you'd have to look further. This is where looking at the literary um, evidence um, surrounding this, this period in terms of archaeology um, comes into play. Both Child and Pickett met sometime in the 1930s as Pickett's entrance into professional archaeology um, began. During this time, the two exchanged a lot of correspondence as well as going on trips to prehistoric monuments and conferences. Pickett even considered asking Child to chaperone him for the first foreign trip with his future wife, Peggy. The professional discipline um, was in its infancy at this time, so the, the, the relationships between archaeologists were a lot closer than today. So I, all of you in this room, I don't necessarily have a personal connection to you, but I know of you or I've read some of your work. 
it's a very different discipline we, we look at now. So it's, it's quite a, um, an intriguing period. So the book records um, the 15th of August 1947, presumably the date of receipt. This was around nine to ten months after Piggott accepted the Abercrombie Professorship at the University of Edinburgh in late 1946, replacing Child who had taken up the directorship at UCL. This is interesting as Piggott had submitted a thesis at Oxford in 1947 in the spring. So one could suggest this book symbolises the moment in time when two archaeologists exchange intellectual chapters in, their, in both their lives, metaphorically and physically. This publication is one of many of the cultural historical models which argued for um, continental but also um, indigenous origins of the Neolithic cultures of Britain. It's of its time in the sense that it overlooks the true nature of Mesolithic relationships to the transition. Um, it does allude to them, but the data set at that time wasn't as comprehensive as it is now. Um, so one could suggest in this sense the relationship um, to the discipline is fixed in the timeline of archaeological object biographies, i.e. it's of its time. That is, if we overlooked at, at the time uh, as a linear entity, so if we looked at time as going in one direction. However, like Lithic's written sources, can also be reinterpreted. So in another sense, it's an open book. Uh, the written word can be interpreted one way or another. And it's a bit like the Brexit maelstrom in British politics right at, the moment, at this moment in time, depending on where you look at it. So um, this eclectic mix of ideas um, on object biographies from a very much a novice uh, standpoint has tried to demonstrate that despite objects giving us meaningful information regarding their biographies, and the narratives they inform, one cannot solely rely on these items individually. Um, it is important to note that archaeology will always remain a discipline of many spheres. One is the archaeology and artifacts, as well as the data they can create, and another being the narratives that are, are written. But I think it's also important to emphasize that we as archaeologists need to increase the dialogue recording the physicality of these publications. They are, object, they are artifacts themselves and should, uh, and should be treated as such in the sense of, the, of a written source, but also the artifact with potential. They are both the embodiment of prehistory. And thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.